remote Pacific island, where an expedition of world-famous scientists investigate incredible rumors of its fantastic mysteries and discover barren volcanic mountains surrounding strange green valleys. Mammoth caves that breed giant mutations. Vampire plants that devour humans. But most astounding of all, the tiniest women in all creation. Sacred beauties of a lost tribe which worships a monstrous creature. What is the secret of Mothra? What is the bizarre spell that awakens Mothra? As these doll-sized girls call to the super god from captivity. Mothra. Mothra, whose revenge is more devastating than any man-made weapon. Mothra, who defies warplanes. Wrecks ocean liners. Smashes dams and bridges. Mothra, creating hurricanes. Mothra, enveloped in a shell that no human force can penetrate. indestructible, all-powerful, indescribable. What kind of creature is this god monster, Mothra? Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a casual conversation, so to speak, with Johnny Parker. Um, is it Johnny Parker 2 or Johnny Parker the second? Because I want to say 2 because it sounds like a badass movie. Oh, <laughs> either or, but generally Johnny Parker the second. <laughs> okay, Johnny Parker the second, and join us in this conversation is Kevin Dorndorf. So, gentlemen, let's introduce um, ourselves. My name is Raffin Shoma. I am, of course, the owner of this uh, channel you're probably listening to this podcast on. I am a uh, freelance artist and semi-expert of all things giant monsters, but not compared to t tonight's uh, guests. Both of them have published works and work in the industry related in and out of kaiju. But let's, uh, let's have um, our guest of honor introduce himself first, Mr. Johnny Parker. Oh, I don't know. Oh, wow. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, my name is Johnny Parker. I'm a comic writer, writer of television, different things like that and everything. Um, I have an upcoming book coming out with IDW, Mothra vs. Mogira, coming out February 21st. So, again, with IDW, releasing like all comic shops. And um, I myself am just more of a kaiju enthusiast. Like, I'm a big fan of the genre, as well as a fan of multiple mediums, anime, wrestling, and a lot of different things. And um, honestly, it was a big honor for me just to get a chance to actually write this book. And I'm genuinely happy to be here today. Thanks again for have me raf absolutely no problem my dear sir and speaking of dear sirs we also have kevin dorendorf and mr kevin dorendorf can you introduce yourself please hey i am kevin dorendorf i am a uh, big fan of kaiju and japanese pop culture kind of stuff as well uh that led me to uh create the blog mazer patrol where i've been occasionally writing and posting things for about a little over a decade now and uh since then wrote a, a book uh, kaiju for hipsters 101 alternative giant monster movies and have a couple of different home video essays and audio commentaries and blah 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 uh accumulated from then and i'm a regular co-host on the kaiju transmissions podcast also all right and at the time of this recording you have an audio commentary coming up would you care to share some information about that yeah, so that's uh, the uh, the Raven Banner release of Shin Ultraman. Uh, so that's uh, that's really exciting. It should be out the 22nd of this month. So that's the Canadian release. I know there's a lot of confusion uh, because Cleopatra Entertainment has the U.S. license, but Raven Banner actually has the, the Blu-ray license for that movie in Canada. So I was able to uh, contribute to the Canadian release. So that's the one I would encourage people to uh, to seek out. 
Okay, excellent. So, Johnny, people pretty much on this channel know how I got into the kaiju thing. In fact, I'm going to be making a separate video before this one gets released. Um, but before we talk about how we got into our loves for tokusatsu and kaiju and whatnot, uh, would you like to discuss some of your other past uh, projects, published or otherwise? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, so I've wrote a lot of comics and whatnot, and um, some published, some self-published. And so my big one that's out right now is The Black Man's Guiding Ink to Pull Over, which takes a satirical look at police harassment and ever to find a solution to the problem. Um, it was published by Microcosm last year in 2022. And so it's a really cool book that I put out. We got nominated for like a couple of awards and everything. Um, it's just a satire where it's like I try to take the subject matter and kind of like look at it through a lens of like comedy to try to find a solution to the problem. And then also I have a couple other books. My one that I really love with this close to my heart is one called Ewoks Are Better Than Hobbits. It's uh, based on the theory of mine that it took the Hobbits five years to do. Ewoks get done in five days because they're badasses like that. Yes, as, uh, we, as we know, Ewoks are murderous, forest-dwelling, uh, killer mini Bigfoots. Exactly, but also efficient killer Bigfoots, and that's the key thing about it. Yes. They get shit done. Yes, and uh, also <laughs> they battled a giant fairy tale alien kaiju in one of their movies. So we have that's to true, exactly that right. Yes, exactly, and they got and they got it done. It's yeah. always like a tell you, but it's like it's like all they had was sticks and twigs, but again, um, they got the job done to help save the rebellion. Yeah, and so that's one of my other books. Another one's called uh, Black is a Brown Hand, a black or brown exploitation comedy that Raph you actually colored for me a couple of times. So thank you for that. Oh, you're most welcome. So I'm a good colorist <laughs> that's true um and then another one i have is called broken it's a video game anime inspired book that i put out that tells the story of this video game princess named aaron who's lost every single battle she's been in until she meets a new fighter named patrick and together they make a pinky promise to become the very best in the world um so a little bit of like my loves right there and then a uh, last book i'm working on is one called daikyu that i released the first chapter of that's out right now it's a uh, rom-com that takes place in a graveyard that's really fun and really dope so yeah i have my coals like a lot of different fires type deals but i'm always trying to write and charlie is trying to do something awesome that is excellent to hear so now ladies and gentlemen as you know we are big nerds for kaiju and tokusatsu so let's go with kevin first uh kevin i don't think we've ever asked you this question but how did you get into the kaiju tokusatsu genre Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in my case, it was really just happened to uh, stumble across uh, Terror of Mechagodzilla when I was playing on television. And I was just kind of uh, immediately hooked uh, because it was not like uh, other other things I'd seen before. So, of course, I, you know, went and started renting tapes of whatever I could get my hands on. And uh, uh, then it ballooned into lifelong mania. Excellent. Excellent. So and Johnny, how did you get into the kaiju tokusatsu genre? Kind of similar to Kevin. Um, growing up, we didn't have cable for a while. So a lot of stuff that I used to watch was just on like, you know, like regular network TV and whatnot. And on some Saturdays, they would actually show like old school kaiju films. So I remember the first one I actually saw that like comes into memory before Godzilla was actually the first Mothra film. And so I just remember like watching that and it like make a bit of impression on me. And then from there, like, you know, I kind of like went in and out of the genre, like watching different films, was always a fan. And then, you know, as um different things like kind of got released in America, I think one that kind of like really put me over the top and made me like a lifelong fan was uh Power Rangers. So then when Power Rangers drops, it's like, you know, every week those kids are battling monsters that turn into giant kaiju. And I was just like, oh shit, and battling like Megazords and whatnot. And that really like hooked me to the genre and made me more interested in like other iterations of like different forms of kaiju and different forms of medium and whatnot. Awesome. You know, it's funny you guys should mention that. I'm not going to dwell on how I got into the genre, but it is interesting that we all grew up, fortunately, in a time where while there was no internet and not all these movies were so readily available on VHS tape, unless, of course, you recorded them yourselves, it was a good time because television stations, both cable and otherwise, cable, local stations, mainstream stations, they still aired old classic movies and many kaiju and monster movies uh, in included. In fact, my first introduction to Godzilla was a 1990 um, New Year's Day marathon on our local Channel 13. And of course, oh. I, as I joke with a lot of people, a lot of kids had Walt Disney growing up. I had Ted Turner growing <laughs> up because TBS and TNT was sort of my crash course into the world of monsters and science fiction and horror in and out of Godzilla. Unless wait, wait, so at some point we need to talk about your love for Captain Planet then, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. I've come to respect Captain Planet as a character, but it's like I never really sat down and watched the series. Though it was always nice to hear like Tim Curry going crazy as a computer character. So well, we got to do like a marathon now. If that's your Walt Disney, we got to get you to watch like a marathon of that at some point. <laughs> that might be that might be funny to do. Just like just a casual live stream uh, mini marathon of Captain Planet. I do know there <laughs> is one Captain Planet episode I do want to watch. 
where they directly referenced uh, Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster by actually having its own kind of Hedra stand-in for the whole episode. Oh, that's sick. That's yes, nice. Yes, yes. So, yeah. But, uh, no, we were very fortunate to grow up in a time where Godzilla movies were more readily available on regular television. And, sadly, those times are kind of lost these days because right now everything is either shoved away onto streaming or completely abandoned altogether, especially with modern syndication packages where 900 channels and they're all playing the same reruns of Big Bang Theory and Two Broke Girls. <laughs> as a, yeah, as that's a, true. That's yes. true. That's yes. true, yeah. But... but that, Go on. I was going to say, but it's kind of cool, too, because I totally agree with you. Like, all the old stuff is kind of hard to get access to and try to find, like, it'd be dope. Kind of like when HBO Max came out, I know one of the things they did that was really cool is they got all the uh, Studio Ghibli films. It'd be dope if one of those streamers was like, we have all, like, the Tokokatsu, like, all the, like, kaiju films, like, this big database right here. Because the, I feel like the older people want it, because I remember back during the pandemic, things were, like, starting to open up, things where people started to get vaccinated. The one movie that came out during that time period that absolutely slayed was King Kong versus Godzilla. And people showed up for that film, which really surprised me. So it feels like the audience is there. Someone needs to just like take advantage of it and give the people what they want. Yeah, I, yeah, it's weird. I think we are in an age where people are starting to love kaiju just for the same idea of kaiju. And it is nice to see the general public having a love for Godzilla and King Kong as opposed to the fandom where there's this really nasty divide of you better be on King Kong or Team Kong or Team Godzilla. No <laughs> ifs and ands. <laughs> can, I be on, can I be on Team uh, Megalon? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to choose. Yes. It reminds, reminds me of the Attitude Era in wrestling where it was like you're either, you're either Team Rock or Team Stone cold you couldn't be both you couldn't be both you only had to choose one wrestler yeah exactly but oh my goodness but what i was going to say is your first movie you saw was mothra correct Mm -hmm. so is so does that kind of tie into the idea of doing a godzilla rival starring uh the big beautiful butterfly (laughs) uh to be honest with you yeah so like when i got ready to do the book because like you know there's like some of the monsters are tied up in like different storylines and different properties and things like that or like things that are coming out in the future. And so when I got ready to do this, they gave me a list of like kaiju that I could and could not use. And looking at what like a lot of the previous that come out, I've seen some people like really tap a lot of different monsters, but like I've Mothra has always been a personal favorite for me. Like again, like you know, like you know, Godzilla's the king of the monsters, uh, Mothra's the queen of the monsters. And so I was just like, dude, it'd be really, really fun, like, you know, like to pay homage to her and like her history, her ties to it and whatnot. So definitely that was like when I gave me the opportunity i was like i want to take the ball and run with this because i know a lot of people would say like if you had an opportunity to do a godzilla book you want to do godzilla but i was like you know i kind of feel that's too much on the nose there's so many other characters to attach to godzilla to play with so like let me go and play with those toys for a little bit and see what i can do with that that's very that's really cool that you say that because um i love giant monsters period so much so that it really kind of annoys a lot of mainstream kaiju fans because you know they're all crazy for the upcoming kong versus godzilla i'm like Oh, when are they going to bring back uh, Gappa? <laughs> or, <laughs> or even or even like more obscure stuff. Like, you know, it's one of the things I love about the Ultraman franchise and Tuber Eye Productions in general, the company behind Ultraman, is that they'll go out of their way to bring bring back the most obscure characters imaginable and give them like a big surprise homage episode. Or in the case of like, like what is it? There's like an alien from Ultra 7 who only showed up in one episode, uh, Alien Chibol, who is Ooh. sort of like this super intelligent octopus type Marvel martian alien who tried to manipulate kids to become murderous soldiers through specialized toys he invented and he only showed up in one episode of ultra 7 cut to like 2010 or somewhere around that era with ultraman ginga s where the main villain is alien chibul with his own little army of henchmen and all that oh that's yeah dope. so <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of insane stuff like that going on but yeah, there is a lot of great monsters in the Godzilla franchise that I think Godzilla can definitely kind of take a back seat a little bit. And to be fair, a lot of these characters aren't coming back to film anytime soon. Like, if you're a Varon fan, you're pretty desperate for Varon material. <laughs> I agree with you. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to do it too, though, because there's a couple of cats who just like have big impacts in the culture, but haven't got a shine in like a long time. Like Jet Jaguar. Mm-hmm. Like Jet Jaguar is such a staple and such a favorite amongst like so many people. And it's like, oh, why isn't anybody doing anything with this? It's like, so again, it's like, I totally agree with you. Cause like a lot of times it's the continuity and history that brings us in. Like for me, I'm also a fan of Super Sentai as well. And I remember the 35th anniversary of Super Sentai Japan was, was I believe, it was the Go Kiger season. Mm-hmm. And watching that, I was like, this is freaking amazing. Not just for all the action and of the actors who were like part of that current like um Sentai Squad generation, but they brought back all the history of the past Sentai characters and whatnot. And really was like a love.
love letter to the franchise. Like, I highly recommend if anybody hasn't seen it before. If you're a fan of Power Rangers or Super Sentai, that 35th season of um, Super Sentai Go Kiger is Chef's Choice. Amazing. Mm-hmm. So, no, I totally agree with you, Rap. It's like, I'm a big sucker for like continuity and history. Yes, yes. And go to touch on Gokaiger briefly, we were very fortunate with that series because not only did Toy Studios actually go out of its way to make it a decent season, but uh, Kevin, forgive me for asking, but the lead I know the lead writer of um, Gokaiger is kind of an expert when it comes to revisiting the continuity of the past, something a lot of uh, toy-based superhero writers do not do so well. Yeah, there are there are anecdotes about like them almost coming to blows on the filming of the Great Legend War episode because you know they're like, oh, should we have Black Condor in this or not? And eventually they decided to have him. But you know, if you've seen Jetman, uh, spoilers, uh, it does not uh, end in a way that you would expect him to be showing back up. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was that was an interesting series also because part of it is actually born out of a tragedy is that there was a 311 disaster, if you recall, in uh, in Japan that year. Earthquake, right? Oh, yeah, it was it was the earthquake that hit uh, Fukushima Prefecture, and then it, it resulted in the uh, the nuclear meltdown, basically. Um, and it was it was real bad in Japan at that time. Uh, and as part of that, there was a Twitter campaign where a lot of actors were kind of you know acting in in character as their their superhero personas to kind of like cheer up children, mm-hmm. and that became really kind of a, a catalyst for you know when they started working on Gokaiju, they didn't intend to have a representative from every single series show back up as a guest star, but basically that's what wound up happening because all of these people kind of came out of the woodwork to cheer up the children of Japan. It's uh, making the best out of disaster there. And as um, as our mutual friend uh, have noted, usually Japan uh, doesn't do nostalgia for past series that much. In fact, it's a situation somewhat similar to American Power Ranger fans, where they'll remember Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but after possibly Zeo, they don't know nothing about the franchise. So after what you just noted, it makes Gokaiger a lot more special in that regard, because they really went in hard getting all these wonderful guest stars and a lot of really fantastic homage episodes that would almost put Tubri Productions to, to blush. I don't want I was almost going to say to shame but yeah there's some really strong contenders in that series not to mention the wonderful spin-off movie Space Sheriff Gavon versus Space Pirate Go Oh yeah oh yeah that was good that yes. was a good one yes, that was good very excellent movie one that I love to revisit often I will say it's interesting you say that because that makes me think of what was the Kamen Rider series that came after that? It was another anniversary season where they tried to go back to different Kamen Riders, but it was like Kamen Rider was like involving time and everything like that, where the protagonist wanted to be a king in the future. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You're talking about Decade? Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that that was a little bit before Gokaiger. Just so, so oh, for, oh, to Zio. some extent, you, Zio? You, yeah, so please. so yeah, Zio is is much later. Decade was for the 10th anniversary of the, the Heisei series, and Zio was for the 20th anniversary of the Heisei series. I think it's, I think it's Zio, because uh, uh, I remember, we were, well, yeah, Zio, that one, yeah, because I remember that one was trying to do an uh, anniversary when they were trying to go back and bring some people back as well, but it didn't, kind of to your point, doing the nostalgia didn't work well for that series all the time. I was going to say something controversial about my thoughts towards Common Rider in general, but I think we'll, we're going to try to keep this a happy... Base, Raph. Don't lose your fan base, Don't say it. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> we could just ask, how how did you get the job for IDW? How did that whole <laughs> thing come about, you know? All right, well, one night I was sitting down with some editors playing Russian roulette when... No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that old chestnuts. <laughs> No, um, so honestly, I've been writing comics for a long time, and um, for anybody who's interested in writing comics, like the, the route to like breaking into the industry, a lot of times is like self-publishing. And the cool thing about self-publishing is that it allows you, especially if you self-publish, you go to comic shows and you meet people or whatnot. You get the opportunity to meet different editors and things of those lines. So for my years of like self-publishing, um, part of the reason why I go to San Diego Comic Con, WonderCon, all these different shows, is to look at the opportunity to meet editors to show them my work. So fingers crossed, hopefully someday down the line I can get an opportunity. And thankfully so is that one of the editors I met was this amazing super talented editor named jasmine joiner uh jazz joiner who was editor at the time they had seen some of my previous work or whatnot and just like you know reached out to me was like hey we got this opportunity um would you be interested in doing this and i was like yeah okay for sure and so that's pretty much how i got the gig as i've known jazz for years and jazz got opportunity to work at idw for like a couple years and then they eventually reached out to me asked me if i wanted to do a book with them and i hopped to it and was like yeah definitely because cool thing about it is those that like there's so many different properties out there in the world godzilla is like a true part of like media history and pop culture history so honestly getting that opportunity was like a big deal for me and it was like an honor to sit down and try to like write stories for these characters 
it, I think it's every kaiju fan's dream to work on something related to the Godzilla franchise. And I know we, we both have mutual friends and rivals in the industry who've been very fortunate to get that job as well. So we discussed your love for Mothra and wanting to touch upon that character, but how does that tie into Mogira, the big old mole robot? <laughs> <laughs> so, again, they gave me a list of like different kaiju I could and could not use, and the thing about this is with the Godzilla Rival series, which a bunch of my friends have had the opportunity to write for, um, it's generally always like one monster versus like another monster, and another monster might make like another kaiju might make an appearance, but as I was getting ready to do this, and they gave me the list, I was like, okay, I definitely want to do something with Mothra, but also as I was like going through the list of kaiju I could use i was like you know there's a lot of robot options on here and the thing about it is though and a lot one of the things he's told me as well is that people really love jet jaguar stories which i do as well and i was like you know no one's ever really done jet jaguar and I'm, at this point people have probably seen the cover mecha godzilla's on the cover as well and so i kind of wanted to do a big robot throwdown okay with poor mothra caught in the middle <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, think about Izzo. So, pretty much, is I just wanted to do something with the robots here, where I was like, you know what? I'm not sure if anybody's like really ever done this or taken advantage of this, but like, because you know, it's always like as a comic fan, there's always like, who would win between Hulk and Superman? This person, this person. Well, amongst like the kaiju robots, I'm like, question is like, who would win? And so, I kind of wanted to get do a chance to do a story about that to kind of give the fans like an opportunity to see like the whole debate um, in a book for once. So now with that says, that does bring up the unfortunately common uh, critique that a lot of people have for Mothra in and out of the Godzilla fandom is that a lot of people treat her as an extreme lightweight. And while there are definitely exceptions to the rules, a big old fluffy fairy tale butterfly doesn't exactly stack up to military hardware super robots and Jet Jaguar too. So, <laughs> w w so what was, how is, okay, you don't have to go into spoilers, but how? What does Mothra bring to the table in such an extreme fight? Okay, so again, I have no spoilers, but I will say that I put some respect on Mothra's name. Trust me, I put some respect on Mothra's name. There's a reason why her name is in the book on the title. Sorry, uh, on the title of the book. It's because like um, she plays a major role. And forgive me with my pronouns when it comes to Mothra, because that was uh, one of the things was like, you know, as we're working on everything like that, discovering that kaiju aren't supposed to have gender. <laughs> wow, really? Because I know that that kind of fluctuates in different um, release material, whether it be the English dubs or Japanese dialogue or even information books on that. But is that something um, that Toho insisted upon, that you don't really touch upon a kaiju's gender? Or is that just some kind of a weird general rule, uh, rule in general, I should say? I guess that's a kind of rule in general. Like, other writers informed me of that rule when I was coming onto the project and everything like that. They were just like, you, just, you kind of want to um, avoid gendering the kaiju, because I guess they're seen as, like, forces of nature or whatnot, which I thought was a really interesting concept. But also at the same time, those like, you know, there's those titles like King of the Monsters, Queen of the Monsters and things like that. And so as I was getting ready to do the book, that was one thing I just kind of get used to because in my head for years, I've always was like, oh, it's Mothra. She's doing this. She's doing that. And so I had to change it to um, a different pronoun. And honestly, when I was writing it, I didn't want to say it. So like when people read the book, I was like, I'm not going to call Mothra it. That feels disrespectful as hell. So I kind of use uh, like they a lot of things along those lines. But again, so going back to your original question. So no, I put some respect to Mothra's name and make sure that she got some time to shine. So there's a few battles that I put into the book and so I don't get no spoilers but trust me Mothra does get a chance to like show her full capabilities and she scores a couple wins that people get to check out in there and even in the, some of the final battles in the book she does play roles okay that's awesome to hear so now uh, Kevin just to tie in I know Mothra is extremely popular, but here in America, she's not exactly seen as a joke, but she's definitely seen, like I said, as a lightweight compared to the likes of Godzilla, Mechagodzilla. What is the general attitude towards Mothra in Japan? In general, Mothra is, you know, one, one of the more popular characters in the roster. I mean, there's a reason why Mothra got an entire dedicated trilogy in the 90s, even if those, you know, didn't perform quite as well as the Godzilla movies. But, you know, being a, a thoroughly heroic monster also helps with that. Oh, my, my wife is just showing me she's currently wearing Mothra socks. <laughs> uh, uh yeah so um okay with yeah that, it's, it's it's with that says we should mention mothra is very popular with uh, female audiences based on that just the little antidote we just heard <laughs> so. yeah i mean that that is uh that is very true um there was uh there was definitely a big uh female contingent of, of fandom that was into the mothra movies but like the you know godzilla versus mothra 92 is kind of like the peak of the the heisei series performance wise mm -hmm. um and you know the original mothra is such a game changer for the kaiju 
genre as as a whole and that it kind of introduces a lot of the very fantastic elements that become staples for the later series and i think frankly saved it because uh without something like mothra we could have gotten stale very quickly and it just uh brought a really uh fanciful element to the whole genre yeah. So I, I think from that perspective, uh, that's a, a crucial development. And there's so much iconography with Mothra from, you know, the fairies to the to the Mothra song. And, you know, it's it's not just, you know, the, the character of the kaiju by itself and the way that like, yeah, Varan is cool, but like there's there's a limit to how much cool stuff you have to say about Varan. <laughs> yeah, that that's a good point to bring up because when you think about it, contrary to popular belief, even knowing Toho didn't do another Godzilla movie until 62 with uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, they did not stop doing science fiction and monster movies between the original Godzilla and Godzilla Raids again because there was also, you know, movies like The H-Man, Battle in Outer Space, and of course The Mysterians, which we'll, tie on, we'll touch upon again when we talk about Mogira. But by the time they got to Mothra, and that was pretty early in the 60s, in fact, it even predated Godzilla's um, triumphant return in King Kong vs. Godzilla, it was nice to get a movie that was not only more lighthearted, but definitely more fantastical. Because the whole thing is, and it's something that you've mentioned yourself in Mazer Patrol with its King Kong-related uh, marathon of articles, that the movie is sort of a, fair, a modern fairy tale take on the King Kong formula. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely from the you know going to the the remote island and bringing something back to civilization that results in the rampage it's even if you look at like tokyo tower being destroyed uh in that movie like that would just recently been built it's very clearly like analogous to the uh empire state building in the original king kong yes and even though toho did a pretty good job experimenting with different uh concepts throughout the 50s with their very science fiction and monster movies I think Mothra definitely opened the gate by introducing magical elements and just pure just pure whimsical fantasy into it. I was almost going to say that also helps the movie assign kind of a musical, but to be fair, musical numbers in kaiju films are as com as Japanese as is to American and apple pie. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, they they stopped doing musical numbers like around the mid 70s with Terra Mecha Godzilla, but before then there was always some kind of wonderful little musical number just showing up out of nowhere. <laughs> It's a common thing, and not just, you know, the fantasy films. It's If you look at, like, the Crazy Cats comedies, they'll just stop and have a musical number for purely gratuitous reasons. Yeah, okay, and to be fair, a lot of old-school Hollywood movies. It could be a serious Western drama, and all of a sudden, old Prospector Jim is going to now play a song on his, on his kazoo. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, oh, God, even the Marx Brothers will take time to let Harpo do something on the harp. Oh, now I get his name. <laughs> well... <laughs> Harpo, that's a terrible pun. <laughs> boo <laughs> on you, Marx Brothers, boo. <laughs> okay, so... Or, you know, like, Reptilicus, that's the same year as Mothra. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Tivoli Nights, oh, what a night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something, there's just something about musical numbers that are just so charming when they just show up in kaiju films. It's a shame, though, that, uh, did you try to put a musical number in a comic book? Because I know how infamously hard it is to do musical numbers in comic books. So. To be honest with you, I low-key, I did. Like, no spoilers. So, in one of my books, Daikyu, as I told you, it's a love story that takes place in a graveyard. Mm -hmm. It actually has a lot of musical elements in it because my main character, mm -hmm. Elvis, is a love junkie. So, the entire book is a bunch of references to, like, different song lyrics and quoted all throughout the book. Everything from Everlast with, um, by Foo Fighters to Prince to um, even like some uh, Biggie Smalls and everything like that. It's all quoted all throughout that book. And then actually when I was doing this book too, that was one of the things I was extremely trying to incorporate was the song as well. But I only had so many pages like to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of kaiju in the book. Like again, no spoilers for people because I think like you as people are going to read it, there's going to be a running checklist because shout out to the kaiju community by the way like i was taking a look at like um the, Wik the wikipedia already put for my page so they already uh put on there like the list of monsters that they've seen on the cover and whatnot no spoilers there's like another monster in there <laughs> <laughs> can't wait to see what surprises are because that's one thing i've enjoyed about the idw godzilla comics like even knowing that there's uh restrictions due to toho they do give a little more leeway to play with the movie monsters, but also include brand new creatures, whether it's a major feature of the uh, comic itself, like the trilopods from uh, Rulers of Earth, or if it's just like n neat little uh, fun creature gags, like, you know, throwing some minor monster in the background or something. But with that says, there's a question here that I think that kind of ties in what you just recently said 
uh, what sort of formatting requirements are there for the uh, Rivals series, like page count, setting, etc.? This is from Kevin, oh. by the way. I'm reading some of his notes. <laughs> oh, for sure. So um, most Rivals stories are generally 40 pages. And honestly, when it came to, like, outside of that, like, it had to be a 40-page story. We were given a list of kaiju that we could and could not use because, again, some kaiju are, like, tied up in other storylines. And even then, outside of that, if you made a pitch for a monster you want to use, they might say yes. I'm like, yeah, sure, it's fine. Um, it just depends because, honestly, what they just want to make sure is that, like, I feel like the rival series like, a love letter to, like, kaiju fans. And so they kind of want to just make sure that they use like a variety of different kaiju for everybody as these stories are going on so that's why the reason why is if anyone's read the series every issue that comes out is featuring a variety of different kaiju so that way you may see some people that may repeat once or twice but they're always trying to like allow like again different kaiju monsters to be featured at different times um but outside of that to be honest with you there was no real constrictions like once it came with my story idea my pitch and whatnot i sent it into them and then they gave me some feedback on it and it was mostly it was mostly just about like how the character should be represented and how the characters have been re represented in the past. Like to give you an example is that DC doesn't show Batman with like grizzle on his face. Like, he's always clean shaven. So like, for example, they don't really do stories with him, like having a beard or anything like that, or like having like a five o'clock shadow or anything. So they try to avoid that as much as possible. When I was doing this book, that was one of the things that I wanted to at one point have Mothra be pregnant because like when she was getting ready to like give birth to her, like, you know, her egg and everything like that. Yes. Um, but that was one of the things that were just like, well, we haven't really shown that before. So we kind of want to avoid that right now. I was like, OK, no big deal. And that was an easy workaround and everything. So it was just mostly things like that. Making sure that like think about how the characters have been like shown in the past. It just makes sure that kind of like doing them justice. And then what was really cool as well is because I'm a kaiju enthusiast. Like I'm a big fan and everything like that. I'm not as historical as like you two gentlemen are. But what was really cool is that they're very supportive in that regard. So as I was writing the story and like, you know, doing certain things and whatnot, they were there to kind of remind me. It was like, oh, you want to be careful about this because of this like historical nugget. It's like, oh, OK, thank you. Or, you know, it'd be cool if you did this, this. And it's like, oh, that'd be awesome so they were just very much there like it's a support and to make sure that got the history right okay that's awesome here because i have heard other interviews with other writers of godzilla material that there are like rules you have to follow with the characters and they're not set in stone but they definitely are adhered to as much as possible is adhered to an actual word or did i just make that up I, I think you're good. Okay. I mean, there's, there, were, there were a couple, but because I guess of like who I was using, I didn't run into those because to be honest with you, I think Godzilla has the most rules around him. Mm -hmm. Like a friend of mine was working on a cover and he was also writing a story at the same time. And one of the notes that he got back was because he had done Godzilla in like a shade of green and he was told, no, Godzilla's not green. He's gray. And so he was like, really? But all these things, like, so he had to go back and like kind of change that and everything. It's honestly just about what monsters you're working with and how stringy they are. Um, okay. And then as I'm thinking about it now, kind of like I gave you the example of like couldn't show Mothra pregnant. There was a couple of times where we couldn't show some monsters and um, like other precarious positions and things like that. And so just general rules like that, but nothing honestly too stringent. It was easy to write around and honestly, it was not a big deal. Okay. Were there were there preferences for like the versions of the monsters you used? Like, could you use the fifty seven Mogra instead of the ninety four one, or or would they like, oh, we really want you to go for the the nineties version or something? Oh, like that? Good, good question. So when it came to that, again, it was kind of up to me to be honest with you. They kind of gave me free reign, but it just meant like if I chose a monster, I had to be certain about that monster's abilities and whatnot. So I give you an example. I was the cover gives away Mecha Godzilla's in the story, and so as I'm having Mecha Godzilla do things, every Mecha Godzilla has different capabilities. Abilities. There are some that are in line with each other, but there are some that are just distinct to a certain one. And so as I was writing the story, I might I made a mistake at one point, and I believe I put in the drill tail. But I had to take that out because this current version doesn't have that. The 95, I use the 95 version of Mechagodzilla. And so it's 95, right? Is it the year? 93, 94. 93, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. So I use that. So I use that version. And so it was just running to things like that, making sure that I was like keeping continuity correct about the abilities and everything. And then outside of that, though, kind of like I was saying before, is that giving story suggestions because I did want to incorporate like some, um, again, like pay homage to like the history of like the franchise and everything like that. So when I was getting ready to do those things, they were out there often um, very cool, like giving suggestions about, oh, well, if you want to do that, consider using this, this, this from this franchise franchise but like oh okay cool and that works but other than that though it was honestly free reign it was like they were just there to make sure that like i got the history correct and i like, did right by like you know the fan base and the history of the kaiju and everything but as far as like tell me what i could and could not do story-wise i honestly didn't really run into that when i did mine and and was it all direct communication with toho or did you go through like an editor at idw 
editor at IDW. Um, so my editor at the time uh, was Dave. And we'll sorry, well, Jazz brought me onto the project, but Jazz was in the process of leaving. And then Dave brought me, the Dave became our new editor. And then when Dave came on board, he was going back and forth with Toho. So like once I finished like my very first draft of the script and we had like cleaned things up and he had given me some good feedback and everything like that. Then after that, he sent it over to Toho and then Toho gave it a read. And then they came back and like gave me feedback about things that they wanted. And again, honestly, a lot of their stuff was um was just like um history based. So when it came to the actual story, none of that was like a big deal for them. They, they liked the story and everything like that and it worked for them. But it was mostly again just going back to the history to make sure that everything lined up continuity wise. Oh, and the homie's name, who was my editor, was David Marriott. So shout out to him because he was fantastic. He was awesome to work with and really helped me out as becoming like a better storyteller. Awesome. Yeah, because staying close to the history of these characters, last thing you want to do is give Mothra a machine gun. So <laughs> <laughs> I Trust would pay me. money for that. Yes. Yeah, that might be a fun picture for anybody listening to draw. So <laughs> I was like, can Mothra carry a blazing sword? No, Johnny, no. We told you this already. <laughs> I mean, have you seen Mothra 3? It's it's not that far off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, nice. <Yeah. laughs> I love Mothra 3. So as much as I would love to, que love to question you about, you know, the Mothra trilogy, I do have a question for both of you gentlemen, and Johnny just touched upon this, but it's interesting how Toho is a lot more, gives a lot more leeway towards the use of monsters in the IDW uh, comic books than it's done with its uh, past um, Dark Horse and uh, Marvel comics of the Godzilla franchise. Is there a particular reason why things have changed in that regard? Mm, to be honest with you, I'm not sure because, like, so for me personally, like, why they, like, allowed so much freedom? Maybe it's because they just wanted to allow, like, the telling of ideas because, kind of like I was mentioning before, it, we're kind of at, like, this weird point where kaiju are very popular, especially, like, in pop culture right now, and in large addition to, like, a lot of the legendary stuff that's being done. And at the same time, legendary is also putting out their own comics. So if I had to guess a theory, again, I don't know, but I'm just giving a theory right now, it might be just to make sure that they're putting out fresh stories and they're just, like, allowing like good storytelling be told without be putting a lot of like constraints on everything like that given that somebody else is out there also telling godzilla king kong stories as well and so that might be one reason why is to make sure that they're putting out a product that's like high as high as quality as possible that they're not trying to put too many leniencies on or like restrictions on but that's just my theory to be honest with you kevin do you have one from from what I've heard, it, it does seem like they're still more restrictive for licensed stuff over here than they are over there. I don't think we're about to see, you know, uh, anything like the, the Shin Japan Universe Robo come out stateside. In terms of why the characters are now more accessible, I, I suspect that that's just a realization that you, you can't solo license Gorosaurus, right? You know, it's uh, it's going to be a package deal for all of the monsters rather than, you know, just doing them piecemeal, which I think was kind of the idea that they had with Marvel and with the Dark Horse. And it's also different because in the Marvel and Dark Horse days, those were both take Godzilla and put them into the established universes of those comic books. Uh, IDW doesn't have a, a universe, so um, it would just be Godzilla book if they're doing a Godzilla book. Rather than having them create a whole roster of enemy monsters, it's kind of redundant. Uh, they might have just said, well, you know, it makes more sense to, to license these out. You've seen a similar situation with the video games over time also. You know, uh, in the movie monster game, they just licensed Godzilla. But by the time you get to like the Atari Pipeworks games, they license a whole bunch of them. So Yeah, and to piggyback off what Kevin said, when you read the Rival series, and I highly recommend to anybody who hasn't checked it out yet, they're kind of self-contained short stories that all take place in their own universe. And so each writer is like, this is, again, we're not uh, picking up and like doing anything like we're picking up where someone else left off and continue telling that story. Each person is doing like their own version, short story in their own universe with Kaiju and everything like that. So that kind of opens up the gamut as well as about what you can and cannot do. Like my one friend, Nick Marino, who's a very talented writer, told his story that takes place in um, a future world where all this stuff is happening yet and everything like that and it's really good i can't remember which one he did uh let me look it up real quick was that the uh the, the rodan versus ebera yeah, that was it. Thank you. And so, like, with his story, which was really awesome, fun to read, again, with his spoilers for it. But again, he took his own, like, own kind of like, I want to say dystopian future in a way and told his story there. Versus what I did mine, again, I just kind of did mine in present times, maybe a few years in the future, but nothing too, like, out of the landish or anything like that. And so, with each story that someone tells, they're again doing their own, like, their own universe and everything like that. So they're not interconnected, which does allow, like, a bit more freedom. 
But to your point, what uh, Kevin just said really quickly is that, like, we could again, we couldn't go off the rails because I remember one of the things in my original pitch that I was trying to do because I wanted to use Jet Jaguar, but I actually wanted to use the medical versions of Jet Jaguar from a kids' TV show that was done over Japan. Are y'all familiar with it? Oh, God. Yeah, got the island. island. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I actually wanted to do that. So I wanted to have, like, this white version of the uh, Jet Jaguar that people could ride in and everything like that. That's actually why I wanted to use in the story. And I wanted to have one of the characters actually pilot Jet Jaguar and fly around helping and everything like that. However, I was told I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's just because I think I'm not sure why I think maybe because of just their laws of like who owns what and everything like that. But yeah, I totally tried to bring into it. There is an artist friend of mine who I'll kind of keep nameless just in case who's worked on a lot of Godzilla related stuff. And he says that not all the characters in the Godzilla franchise are completely owned by Toho because there is sort of some vagueness related to some of the lesser known characters. I, I mean, med- Medical Jet Jaguar is such an example of, like, this is clearly a derivative work. I don't know how you argue that anybody else owns that, especially when Toho is streaming Godzilla mm-hmm. Island on their YouTube right now. But uh, <laughs> they are very fastidious in terms of their, you know, being overly concerned that somebody will come out of the woodwork and sue them. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. what, like if you gave me an opportunity to do a Godzilla story, the first thing I'm going to be saying, oh, I'm going to bring back the Earth Eater from the 78 series. I don't care. And then mm-hmm. I'll be kicked yeah. out. <laughs> and and be honest with you, when I get ready to do this project, I kind of like because I know some people comment about like all the rules and things. I guess when you do like an owned work or a copyrighted work for like somebody else, everything like that. I was a little bit more calm. I was because like a few years ago, I got to read one of the artists, one of the writers on the Marvel Wizard of Oz series, and he just kind of told me, just like you just got to remember these aren't your these aren't your children. And like, mm-hmm. these are someone else's children who you're like, you know, you're taking care of. You're like, you're pretty much babysitting in a way. And so in that regard, as I went into this, I kind of went into it with the expectation. I was like, oh, there are going to be limitations with what I can do. So I don't see a lot of stuff that came up. I wasn't really surprised by it. Um, because I remember one of the things my editors explained to me as well was the fact that like Japan's copyright law is pretty constringent as well for, as far as like making sure, not, not sorry not copyright but also uh, like residuals so like if you use an actor like from one of the movies that was released in Japan and a book here is like well you got to pay that actor now because you're using that character type deal so from what I'm understanding is is that like some of the residual laws and stuff like that can get kind of like dicey sometimes so they kind of want to avoid those situations by not using those characters. Was was like the singular point version of Jet Jaguar on the table, or is that just uh, is was it all you know the kind of uh, pre Rewa era yeah, the mainstream Godzilla movies? Oh, mainstream, yeah, it was mainstream because like once, yeah, once uh, once Medical Jet Jaguar was taken off the table, I was like, all right, I got, I want to go with the mainstream version because like, with the story that I was telling, I won't get no spoilers or anything like that. With the story that I was telling, I wanted to have him play like in the original version of it, I wanted to have him play like kind of more uh, a medical role and everything like that. But once that was taken off the table, I had to retweak the story for it. So yeah, at that point they just said, okay, you can use just regular Jet Jaguar. You know, I'm just going to say this out of the blue. I love discovering like abandoned or unused concepts for various kaiju films. And to find out that you wanted to put medical Jet Jaguar into this comic book is actually a very cool tidbit. So I'm just, yeah. What I discovered is, like, like I said, like I'm not a kaiju historian, I'm a kaiju fan. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, like, when I was getting ready to do this, I did do my like homework though. And I did a deep dive on like each character that I want to use, like to their different incarnations and whatnot. So much so that I was actually putting in moves for Jet Jaguar from the video game into the book to like let people see that stuff as well so i was like when i was like doing like the fight scenes and everything like that well he's gonna do this move he's gonna do this move again that's like so but again i was i was trying to like pay as much homage to those different things as possible um i believe did any of that stuff stay in after the edits did any of that stuff get taken out I, I think that was a fight with uh, when Godzilla Final Wars was in production, actually, regarding, you know, some of, like, Angelus's move set. They had to point to the video game and be like, no, it's it's from here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I, don't, I can't remember how much I got, like, left in it because how much I borrowed from the video game because I made sure to use some moves from the movie as well. I can't remember how many gets, oh, okay. All right. I think, did it get, yeah, it did get taken out. Okay. I can say, so it did get taken out. So I, I tried to put in Jet Jaguar's Ice Breath mm. from the video game. But yeah, that one did get taken out, sadly. Just to add to the point that you gentlemen made about the usage of uh, of the more well-known Godzilla kaiju from the films, I've also noticed in the last couple of years Toho has kind of realized how beloved some of these characters are. And hence, while it's unlikely we'll ever see like Varan or Gorosaurus show up in a mainstream Godzilla film, Legendary or, or Toho or otherwise, it is nice to see these characters get recognized in other concurrent media, especially like in toy releases and of course the comic books. And because of that, we've had something of a oddball uh, renaissance or resurgence of Jet Jaguar's popularity in the last couple of years. Because, of course, you know, you have things like Singular Point, but also Jet Jaguar recently starred in a short film that was, at the time of this recording, was still available on um, the official Godzilla YouTube channel. 
so yeah, I think that also kind of adds and ties into what we've been talking about the monsters in general. But with that said, Johnny, if it's okay, can we discuss the artist you have on the book uh, who sure. goes by the name of Winston Chan? Oh yeah, Winston's the homie. Winston knocked this thing out of art. Like he did an amazing job with this book. So do you have a question about Winston? Or just want me to kind of elaborate more. Elaborate more if possible, because yeah, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I sadly I didn't do my research beforehand, so I'm doing my best to be a good podcaster, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no, you, we're actually, you are killing it again. Thank y'all for having me. You're killing it. Well, okay, yeah, um, so I, I couldn't do half the job without our good friend Kevin Dorendorf here. So yeah, he's yeah, I'm I'm just a shemp to his mo. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yes, but uh, okay, I'm doing a quick Google search, and yeah, yeah, Winston Chan has done a lot of gorgeous artwork. He's done a lot of work for the um, IDW uh, Transformers comic. I think the best artists who can draw giant robots or robot characters are the ones who can make the robots feel like living creatures in their own right, without abandoning or betraying the original designs. But yeah, can you elaborate more on Winston Chan? And with that says, how did you get into contact with him? Was he chosen to pair up with you? Or did you sure. request him in particular because of his uh, great work drawing robot characters? So when everything was like, so after I was like brought into the book and everything like that, they asked me who did I want to work with? And so at the time, I had some ideas of some different people I wanted to reach out to. And um, again, it was just like the people I've known, friends of mine and whatnot. But again, I wasn't sure like who would be able to do this book because again, I'm using robots and I'm using Kaiju and everything like that. So Dave suggested Winston and he showed me some of Winston's work and everything like that. I checked it out. I was like, oh, this is fire. Especially when I saw his Transformers work. And David was right to recommend him for this book because but as well, given that he was doing Transformers, when it came to using all the robot characters, he would know exactly what to do, especially as, like the fight season and everything like that. And so he was definitely the right choice. And um, Winston himself, again, is an amazing artist. And as we were doing the book, again, he's just, he's an amazing artist but his concept of storytelling is also fire as well because as he did this he kind of read my script and i'm a big fan of anime and manga like big time and so as i was reading this within my own script i was making references to different things from different anime and manga whatnot and he kind of caught that vibe and so as we were working on the book he actually wanted to use somewhat of a more different style here so what he did is in this style of the book he kind of used like darker inks so if, when we look at the black and white version of the book it legit comes off almost as a japanese manga and it looks absolutely gorgeous and it really helps with the storytelling and the shadows effects and everything like that. And then as far as like when the book was going and everything like that, he he got exactly what I was going for here. And so he just knocked out of the park and it's going to it's going to look amazing. Like you've seen the cover, which is on the Godzilla Wiki page. That's his cover right there. Even the color choices that he suggests for this kind of help reflect the story and what's going to be happening here in the story and whatnot. And so, again, I definitely highly recommend people go in and read it. But again, even the color choices he, re he did for this cover help uh, foreshadow a lot of the story events, too. So, so is he the colorist for the book also? No, he is the artist of the, he's the artist of the book and he did the coloring for this cover though. So okay. he did color his own cover. So he did cover the cover A. And then as far as the other artists for the book, so Winston was recommended to me by David and I'm so happy that he did. And it's like, we've been to awesome working relationships. And then after that, we started, um, as far as the other two covers go, one of them was my friend, uh, Mike Vasquez, who I've known for years. He's an amazing artist who's done a lot of like, you know, parody stuff, like Adventure Time mashups and Rick and Morty mashups and stuff like that. He's really popular at conventions as an amazing style, but he also released his own kaiju like um, book back in the day. That was kind of like Pokemon drawn as Godzilla's and everything like that. I keep the book in my classroom. Oh, by the way, I'm also a teacher as well, so um, double duty, writing and teaching. And so um, when I got ready to do this book and I was given the opportunity to everything that and things were moving forward, I did reach out to Mike, knowing how much of a big Godzilla fan he is and a Kaiju fan he is. I was like, yo, would you want to do a cover for this? And he was like, yeah. So I was like, awesome. So brought him on board. And then for the third cover that we did, I reached out to a friend of mine, um, Ray Anthony Height. Because Ray Anthony High has worked for everybody. He's worked for, on Spider-Man. He's worked on X-Men. He's worked on all these different things. His own property, Midnight Tiger, is in the own book that he does. And when it comes to storytelling, like, Ray Anthony gets it. And he also gets, like, the history of properties and whatnot. And so when he got ready to approach his cover, I'm not sure if it, I think it's out. I think yeah, you can see it. He kind of did a black and white cover as an homage to, like, you know, some of the, like, black and white kaiju films of, like, yesteryear and everything like that. Which is also, really, like, the storytelling he was doing there. Yes, so I'm looking at that cover right now. I, I love how he made Jet Jaguar look a little more sinister with a really like scary grin there. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's dope as hell. And Mike's cover as well. It's like with Godzilla like in the middle right there looking all badass and everything like that. It was like so dope. So yeah, so that's how that came about. And then honestly, the other person I want to give out to is our colorist as well, Josh. 
So Josh is our colorist, Josh Buncho. And then he just, dude, it was like when I saw Wentz's artwork, I was like blown away by it and everything like that. But when Josh came in and Josh like added his colors to it, it was like everything just like came alive. And the coloring choices he made on the book absolutely just made it like pop to that next level. So doing this book was a really cool process for me because in the past when I self-published, I have to go and find each artist, colorist and everything like that. But with this book, the cover artist, like, you know, I did um, reach out to Anthony, Anthony Height and Mike that's going to be on board. But David recommending um, Winston to me and introduced me to Josh were great calls on this part as the editor because each of these gentlemen came onto the book and honestly helped elevate it to that next level. Like each one helped take it to that next level of like just making it better for the audience. And it makes me really excited for this bad boy to come out in February. You know, it's funny. I kind of prefer getting trade paperbacks when it comes to these comic issues. So I'm kind of waiting for the Godzilla Rivals collections to be out later this year. Um, but with that says, I'm definitely going to make an exception for your comic book because you're hyping it up really well. <laughs> so. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, appreciate it, thank you. Okay. And actually, if, if, if anybody's in the L.A. area, I'll actually be doing a signing for this book at Nostalgia Comic Shops. It's over in um, East L.A. And so if you want to swing by there, I'll be doing a signing at Nostalgia Comic Shop here in L.A. If you want to come by when the book comes out, doing like a little event there. Nostalgia, the people who run that bookshop are really dope. And they uh, actually hit me up and asked me, um, because I have a relationship like with them, because when they used to do East LA Comic Con back in the day and everything like that. Yes. So they actually hit me up and asked me if I'd be interested in doing something with them. And I said yes, absolutely, like right away. Nostalgia Comics, I'll definitely do my best to be down there. And to anybody else listening as well at this point, hopefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, with that says, I'm looking at the notes of questions that me and Kevin had. And Kevin has a, uh, if it's okay with you, Kevin, I'd like to read this one question you have that kind of ties into the making of the book. How long does it take to do an issue uh, from start to finish, or at least in the case of this uh, title? So do you mean from, like, from me writing the script or production of the book, too? From start to finish, yeah. From the beginning, from the pitch, from the script writing to the completion of it. Okay. So honestly, okay, I can't remember when I sent the first pitch, but it was last year, though. So this book is coming out in 2024, and this whole process actually started, I want to say, towards the end of 2022. And so towards the end of 2022 is actually when I um, sent in my my pitch and sending in the pitch wasn't that bad. Like well, I sent in, I came up with one version of the pitch and everything like that, sent that in. And then I was sent back notes just to revise a couple of things and just take a couple of things out. And that's kind of what I mentioned already. I was asked to take out like the pregnant Mothra and the white jet Jaguars, the medical jet Jaguars I want to use, um, as well as like a couple other things. But again, it was no big deal. It was like, oh, they're easy fixes. And I had to adjust the storytelling a little bit. So once I made those adjustments, I sent the pitch in, it was approved. And then it was time for the writing process. And now each one is different. But again, shout out to my editor, Jazz Joyner, because she's really organized and on top of her stuff. So I had a huge breadth of time to actually write my script because she was just planning out the entire Rivals line ahead of time. I was on the slate for this February 2024 release. And so I actually had about, I want to say I had like six months to do my script. So like I had plenty of time to do it. And honestly, it didn't take me six months. Um, I actually knocked the book out in like a couple months and I was just me just wanting to make sure I was refining things because I was using a lot of different monsters um, as I mentioned before like I was looking at this Wickedzilla page and there's two monsters who are in this book uh, who aren't listed here I won't spoil but there are two more monsters who are who appear in this book we will see that aren't listed here which is really dope and so I took me about two months to write the script polishing it up making sure my storytelling was tight make sure I liked everything that was happening there because I just want to take my time with it um, then I sent that off and then I, after I sent it off to my editor my editor came back with some just very basic notes um just about me maybe like fixing a couple like minor things um which i took care of like right away which is no big deal and then after that i went to toho and then toho came back with the continuity notes so when it came to those continuity notes those were just again making sure that the continuity was right for each monster is being used things lined up with their abilities their histories their appearance and so on and so forth which was again no big deal so that was like pretty easily done um we went through like a couple revisions of that and then after that, once it was already on board, because once it went by that initial phase, like um, the, the green light was given, we were just polishing things up on the script. And once it was on board doing like character designs, which he looked choice from the, the get go. And those looked amazing. So he started the character designs, uh, which we went back and forth about just like the thing was like just one or two emails. just about appearance of characters, how they might look and everything like that, which we knocked out like super easily. After that, he started drawing. And honestly, for anybody who's ever made comics before, the drawing is the hardest part. <laughs> it's, the, it's the part that takes a longest artists put in a lot of work on that and so after that once it was drawing and once it was just like you know just knocking that bad boy out um knocking it out page by page by page and it was looking amazing it was coming in and i will say the book was probably done being drawn probably by 
think I want to say September, Winston finished drawing the book. Yeah, I believe he did. I think he sent his, I think I believe he sent his final pages in around September, around Labor Day, uh, around late August. And then at that point, it went to colorist Josh, who was, as he was sending pages in, Josh was also coloring. And so Josh has been coloring this whole time. And then once the coloring was done, the lettering was being done. And then we were giving feedback. We were giving feedback on the lettering about just like just things that we may have saw, like, you know, maybe a typo in my script or just maybe like something that was missed. Or once you see everything on the page, things that may not make sense about adjusting those things. And then that's about it. And the book was like kind of wrapped to put to bed and I was getting ready to come out. So I would say the whole process is about like one year. Okay. Do you do uh, like a uh, panel layout roughs or just kind of leave that to the artist and uh, um, how everything's framed? Sort of like thumbnails uh, or sketches for each page. So when it comes to comic book writing, there's a bunch of different ways to approach it. And so I do a panel by panel breakdown. And so when I write, I intentionally make sure not to like overcrowd up the pages. So that way the artist has enough room for the art to breathe and everything like that. And enough room to like, you know, do some dynamic storytelling, especially with Kaiju, because one of my critiques is I examined like past Kaiju books from like different publishers and different things I saw online is that I wanted to make sure there was enough art so these Kaiju could look big on the page. So I didn't want to overcrowd it and everything like that. So I try to give myself like panel caps where I wasn't exceeding putting like a lot of panels on the page. Page, anything more than like four or five was kind of like my max at times mm -hmm. and so i didn't want to just overcrowd that and then i don't do thumbnails myself but i'm a big visual storyteller so as i'm writing my script i kind of visualize what it looks like in my head but i don't tell the artist that because i don't want to influence what they're doing mm -hmm. because they're visual okay. storytellers too but in my head as i'm writing i'm envisioning okay this is where this could look like i would have like i put like a big panel here three small panels down here and then the word balloons will go here 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 and just visualizing that myself so that way i know i'm not overcrowding the page Page or making it hard for like the letter as well where they have to like put the lettering in there and then lettering is like covering up the artwork and stuff like that so those are all conscious choices i'm doing as i'm writing the script and also as i'm revising the script so as i once i do like a first draft that's one of the main things i'm going back as i'm revising is i'm looking at my own dialogue making sure i'm not being too wordy to the point where i'm going to end up covering up the artwork or anything like that and also just looking for pages where like a page is like too cluttered where it's like oh is this possible all of this to fit on a page and just making choices along those lines but in the actual process though once the script is sent in the artist does send me back their thumbnails so once i sent in my version of script before we got started though winston did do a round of thumbnails where he sent them to me and the editor and we just looked them over just to kind of get feedback in case like i missed something that i described well enough or in case there was a mistake made or whatever or anything like that but again winston is an amazing artist he knocked out of the park so like we did get thumbnails from him and we used those to kind of help inform the process of the book good question Mm -hmm. uh so, so so i imagine that there's probably a number of you know if, if, if it takes you know basically two years to to do an issue i'm, I'm guessing that several issues are kind of in production at the same time how was that all kind of coordinated by the editor in terms of uh like i, I noticed that the uh the issue right before yours is the megalon versus jet jaguar just in terms of like ma making sure nobody's stepping on anybody else's toes with their uh depictions and stuff like that yeah, so again, shout out to Jazz because Jazz was the initial editor of these books, and then David came on when Jasmine um went on to other things. And so Jasmine is extremely organized and on top of her on top of their game. And so they made sure that everything was kind of planned out, so everything was kind of like on a schedule. So we were like far in advance. And to be honest with you, comics aren't always like this. Sometimes you uh sometimes things come down to the last minute where you might have a script that's due like in a week, like in about a month, and then your artist is jumping on it, and a lot of things are hype happening simultaneously. But this was just a very well organized structure machine where we had plenty of time to do things so there was no stress or rush on anything um again that's all due to jazz and then to your question about just like being organized that was one thing that did come up but not for me in my book because again my book has a lot of moving parts to it where i'm using a lot of different kaiju and whatnot however i know like for example my one friend mark l dude who did the godzilla versus mega godzilla the one that came out last month i believe in november mm -hmm. yeah so when he did his i remember that was one of the things that came up because when he did his initial pitch mega godzilla was already being used in a book and then but his pitch was just so awesome they were like all right yeah, yeah go ahead and do it again and so that was just something that kind of came up there but again they love this pitch and love this idea and it's a dope book and so they just kind of went ahead and rolled with it and everything well, to your question kevin that is something that is considered but it does again um, as i said before each person is kind of doing their own storytelling in their own world so they weren't really like enforcing that that much because to be honest with you i think mecha godzilla at the end of this the kaiju that's used the most in all these books because everyone that i know because i use Me i use mecha godzilla mark used mecha godzilla and then my friend james wright who also did one of these he 
also used Mega Godzilla. He did the story. Where is it? Uh, let me go back. It's he did uh, that. That was the that was the Rodan versus Ebera. Uh, the 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 one that we mentioned before was uh, Violante right. versus Destroya. Oh, yeah, so yeah, Rodan. So he did Rodan versus Ebera. And um, again, no spoilers, but uh, yeah. So I think so. Again, I think Mega Godzilla may be the one that's used the most, like all these books. Yeah, I think it's safe to say Mecha Godzilla is a very popular character. But that kind of yeah. ties into a question I have. Okay, so obviously you've mentioned this previously that you love giant robots and you want to throw in as uh, many of the giant robot heavy hitters in the Godzilla franchise. But why Mogira? Do you, what's your connection or at least opinion of the character and why him as sort of the uh, headlining character, so to speak? So again, I'm a big fan of giant robots, just in general. Like I've always been a big fan of giant robots growing up from anime series like Gigantor to even things like Metabots and like a bunch of other different stuff like that. And so honestly, it was I was getting ready to do this and I knew I wanted to do a robot throwdown. I was like looking for robots that I could use. And so when I looked at Mogira, I just kind of liked his like aspect of like his transformer, like almost like DNA that's in the character from like his different forms and everything like that. And I was just really attracted to all the different things he can do from his different iterations. And I was like, oh, this dude is fun. Like this is a lot of cool stuff you can do with him. Yeah. Just to quickly mention, yeah, now that you mention it, Mogira does have a lot of similarities to, say, a Power Ranger Zord or like a Super Sentai Mecha with the multiple mm -hmm. parts and whatnot. Exactly. So honestly, when I saw that and like all the stuff they can do, I was like, "Oh, this dude would be bad, eh?" And it's getting, like, and I was like, and I was like, and I was really attracted to like all of his like his history and everything like that when I was doing the research. And so I was just like, "All right, I want to use him." With that says, though, we know about your background with the Mothra movie, the original Mothra. What's your opinions, or at least review, if you will, of Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla that introduced the Heisei era version of Mogira? Mm. I thought it was fun. Like when I went back and was doing the research and like checking it out and everything like that, I actually I always liked that version of Godzilla with the crystals coming out and everything like that. Space Godzilla. Yeah, I've always liked that version of him where he looks almost like he went Super Saiyan or something, or like almost like evolved in a way. And I was like, ooh, that's badass. And so honestly, like I enjoyed it. It was cool. Like when it comes to like I said, like I'm more of a fan and enthusiast, so there's very few things I come down like really negatively on. A lot of stuff I just kind of look at, especially at the time, and kind of have an open mind to it and everything. So uh, there's nothing. There's very rare that I come down like super negatively on stuff at this point we co uh, covered most of what the uh, comic is about if you want we can just kind of just nerd out about c certain godzilla things just to kind of round out the rest of the podcast so with that says kevin if you i mean damn it not kevin <laughs> There is a Kevin in this conversation. I'm not making stuff up, okay? <laughs> With that says, Johnny, if you want to ask us any oddball Godzilla questions, as we'll probably ask you oddball Godzilla questions in return, I do have to ask you a question because it is the beginning of 2004. The beginning of 2024. 24, okay. <laughs> yes. Godzilla Final Wars just came out in theaters. No. <laughs> um, did you get a chance to see Godzilla Minus One? And if so, what's your review of it? Oh, yeah. Uh, that was actually my question for y'all to ask you what you all thought of it. So I saw it and honestly, just as like a film by itself, I liked it a lot. I liked a lot of the allegory for like the, the story telling the history of like the Japanese people after World War II and everything like that. And that time where they're trying to like rebuild after like all the stuff that went on and everything. And I really enjoyed it a lot because as I was watching it, spoilers, I guess, is that like I kind of felt that like after like in a way losing a war, it's almost like how do you reclaim your honor in a way? And a way, like, as I was watching the film, it was almost a way them defeating Godzilla was the way of them almost, like, reclaiming their honor or, like, the respect and getting that back and everything like that by getting, like, a significant victory in a way that allows them to help them heal and move forward. But in addition to that, though, I also just love the storytelling with the main character about the PTSD and dealing with that and everything like that. And also talk about the, being critical of the whole, was it the, the kamikaze, like, pilot system being critical of that, that part of the history and everything like that, which I thought was just really, really good. And so, honestly, going into there, like, especially after, like the legendary films where you just like going to like kaiju films like some beat them up punch them up stuff and the human storyline is just kind of like black this was really 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 good human storyline here that really brought me in made me invest in the characters remaining question is just uh if, if there have been rumblings about you know this is the last godzilla rivals thing that we've seen to date if that's uh successful and continuing or uh johnny's heard anything let's see here I honestly haven't heard anything. Okay. Things have been changing over there. So I know like we're shuffling around editors and things like that right now. So I don't see I haven't heard anything. I was actually going to reach out after this book comes out because I'm actually developing another pitch that I want to do with Godzilla. But as far as um Godzilla books that are coming out, a friend of mine, Rosie Marks, actually has a Godzilla book coming out this summer, I believe. It's a graphic novel that's about uh, actually um baby Godzilla. Mm-hmm. 
So that's supposed to be coming out, I believe, this summer. So, uh, yeah, Godzilla uh, Monster Island Summer Camp. And it actually looks pretty intriguing. I, lo- I love the image of just all these, like, human ladies hanging out with Aminia in just this very wholesome, almost Studio Ghibli-type uh, comedic fashion. Oh, that's dope. I'm happy you say that because all low-key, like, um, she describes that's exactly what she was going for. And the book looks amazing. I've been privy to, like, take a look at some of the art and everything for it. And that book looks so good. And the storytelling that um Rosie is, like, doing on that book is outstanding. So, honestly, I think people are going to generally love that book when it comes out. Oh, but before we left, we were talking about Godzilla Minus One. I was saying um, I loved everything that they did with that film with the human storytelling and whatnot. And actually, I legit also love some of the special effects they got to do in that movie as well. But that that scene where Godzilla's like almost healing like Wolverine with his jaw gets blown off and you get to see it regrow right there. I was like, oh, okay, I'm actually a fan of this. And so on a limited budget, I got to say, like, I was pretty impressed with what they did with that as a Gaiju film. But I wanted to ask you guys, what did y'all think of Godzilla Minus One? Let's go with you, Kevin. Uh, I, I think I've, I've warmed up on it quite a lot. I, I liked it when I first saw it, but it just kind of uh, have uh, been coasting on, you know, the positive reception that it's been getting from so many other people. You know, it's something that I don't think it breaks a whole lot of new ground, but what it's doing, it, it does well. So, um, you know, it's a, it's like a really good vanilla, uh, so to speak. <laughs> Okay, for me, I was pleasantly surprised with the movie. Granted, I think if I see it a couple more times, I might change my opinion on it, but I've seen it four times so far. And at the time of this recording, I was able to catch it the night before it left theaters. And um, quite frankly, I liked it very much, but then again, it probably like kind of um, turned on all my personal switches. Like One thing, I love the show era of uh, Japanese monster movies, uh, particularly Toho. So the fact that this movie took place in a point of history that has never really been dealt with in the Godzilla Godzilla franchise was very welcoming. With that says, it's also a wonderful cinematic example of alternative history done well, because usually that stuff can be done pretty, pretty poorly. And here, I loved a lot of the elements they brought in, including using like a real world experimental plane that never saw combat and actually incorporating it into the climax, which was really cool. And while my preference is for like a slightly nicer Godzilla, and it would be kind of nice to see Return to Superhero Godzilla outside the clunky blockbusters of the legendary films, arguably this is not the most evil Godzilla, but he's just outright angry. This is the angriest Godzilla ever seen, and I think it works on many levels. But for the most part, yeah, I'm very happy with the way this movie has done, and I can't wait till it gets a home video release. I'm just hoping it's something better than what happened to Shin Ultraman here in America with Cleopatra releasing. And to tie that back to you, Kevin, I am looking forward to the Canadian uh, Raven release. Yeah, uh, looking looking forward to that one uh, myself. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, in terms of what happens with uh, Minus One on, on home video, it's difficult to say. It seems like if you look at the, the Japanese side of stuff, uh, the Polygon trilogy we haven't gotten physical releases of here or Singular Point, but you know how that, much that, that might, is. Done. That might have to tie in more with the fact that those were Netflix co-productions and a lot of yeah. streaming services don't like to put their original shows on physical media, especially Netflix. Mm-hmm. So I think there might be there might be better hope with um, Minus One, but that's just me being honest optimistic so with as successful as it has been in the theaters i think that gives it a better shot than if it had you know come out and done you know shin common rider numbers sorry just last question if they doing a sequel because it honestly looks like with the success of it and the way that it ends and because honestly that was one of my favorite parts of it as well was the ending the fact that um the love interest did survive because at first i like which legit almost made me tear up to be honest i was like oh my god no <laughs> she can't die so i'm seeing her survive and everything but let me just ask you this in a follow-up sequel do you still want to see like a singular godzilla movie or would y'all want to see more of a kind of your point raf a godzilla versus somebody where godzilla may uh come back as more a heroic role Then like, what do you think they'll do in the sequel to this Well, I do know for a fact that the Toho has officially announced that they will be doing another Godzilla movie, but they're going to take their time on it. So it's going to be another sort of like the uh, gap we have between Shin Godzilla and Godzilla Minus One. And I know the director of Godzilla Minus One has shown interest in doing a follow-up film. Although I don't know if he meant directly from Minus One or a completely different film. And God bless the Godzilla franchise. They are not cheeky or vague about, oh, we're just doing our own self-contained stories. You don't have to worry about continuity here and there. And I'm very happy that we're still getting Godzilla in many regards there. But if they were to do a next Godzilla movie, regardless if it's a direct sequel or otherwise, it would be nice to see more than just Godzilla in it. It would be nice to see other monsters revisited. And while I have some of my own ideas, who knows if I get an opportunity to do a Godzilla story. So I'll keep tight lip and my wish list of <laughs> Godzilla this and Godzilla that. Although, unrealistically, I doubt the Earth Eater or El Gusano Gigante will ever get their own buddy cop action comedy. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> um, that sounds delightful. Yes, it does. So, um, so with that says, though, we're going to be wrapping uh, down. But before we end the night, I do have one last question for Johnny Parker. Outside, sure, the, right. outside the original Mothra, what are some of your other favorite Godzilla movies or Japanese monster movies in general, if you wish? Oh, okay. Favorites, 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 favorites. Uh, or if not, you can just mention kaiju you like from the Godzilla franchise, like other monsters outside of Mothra. Um, I'm a big sucker for uh, Godzilla versus King Kong, not the legendary one, which is cool. But that original one, I found to be hilarious because I like how they introduce like those like different powers in it. Whereas like, uh, was it like King Kong? Like, was it like Godzilla's weak against electricity, and King Kong electricity makes him stronger and everything? Yeah, that kind of cracked me up. I was like, really? <laughs> um, so they used to introduce strengths and weaknesses in that film. Plus, that's my favorite Godzilla move of all time, which is that Godzilla drop kick, where he just like jumps and just like flies across everything. So I'm a huge fan and sucker of that film. Um, that's one of my all-time favorites. In addition to the original Mothra, like as I stated before and everything in the history of that. Um, legendary films are cool. Kong Skull Island, I thought was just effing awesome. To have Samuel L. Jackson and Kong be like um rivals in that film, I thought was amazing, and I thought they did it really well. Plus, John C. Riley is hilarious in that film. And I also love I just want to quickly just add on to that of all the legendary movies, I think Skull Island is my personal favorite too, because it reminds me heavily of the Doug McClure versus rubber dinosaur films from the late 70s i grew up with except with king kong <laughs> <laughs> no i feel you and then, um no it's dope it was i, I agree with you. i think it's one of the best ones just because again they like the storytelling that i thought was really strong the performances were amazing john c riley gives some of my favorite quotes there like when he runs to the soldiers on the beach he's like you're a fine group of boys you're a fine group of boys to die with and they're like wait what <laughs> And I thought that he was just delivering these one liners that were just absolutely outstanding. And again, the history and how they're kind of building that up there, I thought, like, as they were building their universe, was really good. Then, as far as his like, favorite kaiju go, um, Mothra's up there, Godzilla, of course, Mecha Godzilla. Uh, weirdly enough, I'm just being honest, like, my one of my favorite, favorite uh, kaiju, and I'm not even sure it counts as a kaiju, is actually Dragon Sword. You know, here on Enshoma's channel, and I think Kevin would agree as well, a giant monster is a giant monster, so we're not that Kevin just about... logged out, man. What are you talking about? Kevin just logged out. I'm joking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I know a lot of people like to make a big deal about what counts as a Japanese giant kaiju uh, compared to what doesn't count as a Japanese kaiju. But considering in recent years, the subject has become incredibly lax, especially with the Japanese general public. Um, and not only that, but it's like the kaiju genre has, or tokusatsu, has always been a supernatural kitchen sink before that term was ever created. So you can have a wide variety of weird creature characters, as long as they're gigantic and awesome and fun and fantastical it's more than okay so yeah i think dragon zord is a perfect example because that character hits a really good sweet spot of being a giant robot but also you may not know this the dragon zord in the original Jew ranger series was deliberately meant to be a g direct godzilla homage so he is oh. so he's basically heisei era 1990s godzilla and samurai armor as far as that design goes <laughs> And to be totally honest with you, that's what I thought as well as a kid. Like as I was watching it, I wasn't super fan of the of the of making as sorry as a uh, Dragon Zord at first because I remember when the character first appeared, I was like, that ain't nothing but Mecha Godzilla. And then it's like, wait, am I getting Mecha Godzilla every week on my television? Yes. <laughs> and honestly, that's what made me fall in love with the character so much because that was a cool thing about it is that like because again with kaiju films is again they don't come out like every year per se. And again, it's always a variety of different characters. But again, thanks to Power Rangers, I'm literally getting like again Mecha Godzilla every single episode, fighting somebody, doing stuff, transforming, get to see all those abilities. And I think that's what made me fall in love with the character so much because as already a Mecha Godzilla fan, now I'm getting Mecha Godzilla on a daily basis thanks to Power Rangers. And then after that, I'm a huge fan of Ultron. Like, I have the Voltron Netflix series I thought was really well done for the first couple of seasons. Things kind of, like, went off the wire a bit from um, things that happened in production and the behind the scenes and whatnot. But I think that was a really, really strong storytelling, and I was, like, really excited for that. And then there was one more I was thinking of here. Uh, one more giant robot. Da -da 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 I guess, shoot, that was, I can't remember what it was, but also just Transformers in general. Like, my, ba my favorite aspect of Transformers is the Combiners. And so for the longest time, like, you know, when the construction cons are like transform and form devastator for the longest time, I was like, let those dino bots combine and whoop some ass. <laughs> like, please like let them put in some work. And so again, um, I love the combiners that transformers introduce as well. Their own form of like Kaiju in addition to like, you know, like Metroplex and like all the different giant city types of transformers and in Unicron, of course. But I just love the aspect of like these transformers getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which I thought was like a really cool creative concept for them to do. Very awesome to hear. So, and Kevin, do you have any final questions you have for Johnny or any uh, points you want to bring up before we kind of wrap things up? 
Uh, this this might be a this might be a spoiler, so feel free to uh, to ignore or edit it out. I just noticed that on the uh, the trade paperback for Godzilla Rivals, uh, King Caesar's on the cover. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was maybe one of the uh, additional unannounced monsters so far. Oh, all good, all good. It's not. Okay. <laughs> it's not. It's not. No, there's um there's a couple on there who aren't on the cover who make an appearance too though. And also shout out to my friend James Wright. I was looking at his uh the Wikipedia page and I, and I he has a ton of in his book as well. So go check out just go check them all out. The trade paperbacks I believe are sold in Barnes and Noble and most comic book shops, but I think they're available on Amazon. So I would highly recommend people go check them out. There's a lot of great storytelling done by a lot of talented great people. Yes, yeah, so far from what I've seen of the Rival series, it has been a wonderful addition of the Godzilla franchise. These just fun little anthology stories with like varying artwork, different continuities and related rules to the related universes, and a lot of wonderful classic monsters, as well as a couple of new ones here and there. So yeah, it's yeah. been a major success, and I'm very happy, I'm honestly proud for you, Johnny, to be a part of the Godzilla franchise in this regard. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Rap. I appreciate you. And honestly, it's just it just feels an honor to be part of it, to be honest with you. Like like again, it's like like I said, when I got the opportunity to do this, I was like, wait, for real? And again, it's like a way of like, you know, being a part of history in a way, because Godzilla is just like such a respected character within like, you know, science fiction, pop culture, comics, movies, film, television, a variety of different like genres or whatnot. It's just, you know, cool to be part of this and to get to tell stories within that world. And um again, I just the book comes out February twenty first, and I just hope everybody enjoys. Indeed. And Kevin, as always, it is wonderful to have you around. Like, even knowing that people say that I'm a pretty good kaiju expert, I'm nothing compared to you, sir. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, well, everybody has their own specialties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, thank you for joining us, Kevin. Your presence has definitely made this uh, conversation a lot more professionally unique i think i would say <laughs> my vocabulary is limited but yes <laughs> ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining us and um any last plugs oh. you want to give oh that was exactly right i was gonna say if anybody wants to give me a follow you can find me at johnny p313 that's j-o-h-n-n-y-p313 i'm on instagram um what used to be twitter that was just x um and other platforms bluebird and all those different things like that you can find me there at johnny p313 and again the book comes out february 21st and i'll be doing a signing at nostalgia comic book shop and i'll be having that book there as well as some of the other ones i mentioned as well die cute ewoks red and hobbits black Fist brown hands a bunch of other cool stuff Yes, and with that says, I will do my best to get this podcast ready well before the release date of uh, Godzilla Rivals, Mothra vs. Mogira. And Kevin, any last things you want to plug? Uh, I, I don't particularly think so. I mean, I do most of my posting on the Mazer Patrol Facebook page right now, and I think everything I post gets uh, gets reposted by you, Raf, to uh, Kaiju are unusually tall, so it's uh, we're, uh, we're in business there. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you've you come up with some really cool articles and also really neat kaiju discoveries as well, especially for someone who loves the more obscure side of this whole franchise. And I guess I'll have to plug in some stuff too, but I'm going to try my best to put as much of the links that have been mentioned throughout this uh, podcast in the description below. But yes, we have a Facebook group called uh, Kaiju is Unusually Tall, where I just basically share as much stuff as I find as uh, kaiju from both my own collection and also from other people's posts. And of course, there is a YouTube channel, but there's also my two Twitch channels, the the real Crimson Weirdo, and in Shom uh, in Shoma Lives or in Shoma Lives, if you wish. And of course, there's my DeviantArt page. And throughout 2024, I'm finally bringing back my blog in Shoma's Corner. Back to oh. some, yeah, back to some weekly life. So you'll be sure to find a bunch of neat, interesting stuff there too. So, but no, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. And in the future, I would like to do more podcasts with either both of you or separately or together. We'll see what happens. I'm definitely up for that Captain Planet mini marathon. If you're up for that, Johnny. <laughs> That'd be it's basically Voltron. Yes. <laughs> Hard. <Pretty much. laughs> Fire. Yes. So, and ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, the question has been asked why. Oh, hold on. I'm trying to think of something clever and stupid to say at the end of this, because I know I was thinking of calling this podcast. Uh, why does Mogira hate Mothra, Mr. Parker? But I think we've, <laughs> we've answered that question pretty well, and it was mostly from a place of love. <laughs> so, nice, nice. <laughs> okay, so thank you for joining us, and we will see you guys another day. Thanks for having me. Thank you, gents. Appreciate y'all. Of course. Yeah, thanks for answering all our questions. <laughs> <laughs> Insert Mothra roar, fly out. <laughs> <laughs> flat, flat, flat. Yes. <laughs>